Hello, good evening, everybody here at Town Hall and out there on Sandwich Community Television Land. Uh, welcome to the Sandwich Candidates Forum, sponsored by Sandwich Community Television and the Sandwich Enterprise. My name is Greg Anderson. Welcome, all of you. Um, here's what you can expect tonight. You will hear from the three candidates vying for school committee uh, first. Then we will take a very quick break, enough to move some of the chairs around and the, and the place uh, nameplates. Uh, and then we will bring the four candidates up for selectmen, uh, and they will have their part of the evening. Generally, we're looking at about 45 to 50 minutes per chunk, per race, if you will. Uh, to be clear, that this is, um, this is not a debate. Uh, there will be no timing of questions uh, or answers. Um, this will really just be a Q&A. The only area or the only time they will be timed is for their opening statements, which each will have one minute. My job is to facilitate a discussion between all of us, uh, the candidates, uh, and, and each other. In other words, it's my responsibility to manage the flow of the evening uh, so candidates have their chance to speak to the issues that are really important to them. Uh, after opening statements, I will basically be running this Q&A. I want to give you a couple of ground rules for those of you in the room. Um, I will move about the room. I'm going to take this microphone, and I'm going to, after I uh, start things up, I will move about the room, and I will go to those who raise their hand and say, I got a question. Uh, when I come to you, I would ask that you please stand, give your name, address, pretend it's town meeting, uh, and speak into the microphone. Comments from off mic won't be, I will encourage that we don't discuss or address those questions. Everything really should go through that microphone so people at home can hear what is being said. Uh, to make sure as many people can ask their questions, I will ask you to be brief, avoid commentary and dissertations of opinion if you wouldn't mind. And of course, I'm not going to allow any personal attacks or anything that does strike personal. Um, this is a candidates forum here in Sandwich for Sandwich candidates. That means national platform uh, or statewide uh, platform issues is not up for this part of our discussion or at least this forum. Uh, we want to talk about sandwich, sandwich issues uh, exclusively. Finally, um, some of you may, uh, or maybe many of you, will leave here frustrated that you didn't get your question asked, whether we just ran out of time or something else may have occurred. I kindly ask that you understand that I'm going to do the best that I can to move around, move things, uh, keep things going, uh, with one goal in mind, that we are going to get to as much as we possibly can to help you be as educated as you can be about these candidates before you vote on May 5th. So, we are broadcasting live on Sandwich Community Television. Thank you to Rob and Paula. And uh, so this will be, it is live now and then taped for broadcast uh, many times over and over and over and over for people to see again, again, and again. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, each candidate uh, is given that one minute to give an opening statement, and we agreed to do this in alphabetical order. I'd like to introduce these three candidates. Uh, we will start with Danielle Benietta, then we will go to Christine Brown in the middle, and then Erin Selfridge. So why don't we start with Danielle? Thank you. My name is Danielle Benenda. My husband Jamie and I have lived in Sandwich for 16 years. We have two children in the Sandwich Public Schools. Abby is in seventh grade at the STEM Academy and JT is in fourth grade at Oak Ridge. We have always been strong advocates for our kids and for public education. I've been the chairperson of the Sandwich Special Education Parent Advisory Council for the last four years. This has given me the opportunity to help families navigate through sometimes some, some tough special education decisions in the process. So, but it's been, it's been gratifying to help work with families and keep the lines of communication open between the administrators and the parents. The last few months, I've been on the superintendent search committee. Hiring a superintendent is the primary duties, one of the primary duties of being on the school committee. This is what really motivated me to jump into this race. I'm a relationship builder and a problem solver, which are essential tools 
to be effective on school committee. I kindly ask for your vote on May 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And now let's go to Christine Brown. You're on mute. I knew I'd forget it. Um, I'm Christine Brown. Uh, my husband and I have been residents of Sandwich for 22 years. We've raised our children here and proud to say that they've attended Sandwich Public Schools from kindergarten all the way through graduation and are now successful and happy outside of Sandwich Public Schools as well. Um, I've been a library trustee on the Sandwich Public Library for, t for the last eight years, and I've been a lifelong community volunteer, engaging in opportunities from a PTA to um, Sandwich Community Partnership to a variety of different avenues and adventures um, involved in my children's education. Um, I believe in supporting safe, enriching learning communities for all students and educators. I believe in responsible and transparent spending and I believe in updating and maintaining school buildings and playgrounds. I hope I have your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And Aaron Selfridge. Hi, my name is Dr. Aaron Selfridge. My wife and I have lived in Sandwich for 13 years. We have two wonderful children, one in kindergarten at Forestdale and another in third grade at Oak Ridge. In my professional life, I've been a chiropractor for 20 years, serving several communities, including many patients from Sandwich. I grew up uh, in Marson's Mills, on the Marson's Mills Sandwich line. My childhood was full of days playing golf at Holly Ridge and street hockey in the Sandwich High School parking lot. I attended Barnstable High School and then went on to complete my uh, pre-med degree and eventually graduated from Life Chiropractic College in Atlanta, Georgia with my doctorate in chiropractic. I'm excited to work together with the current and future school committee members as well as the incoming superintendent, Joe Maruzak, if I was elected. I tend to be a voice for all parents and all of our children in this district, as I believe that parents need more representation and decision making as we navigate post-pandemic learning. We pay the highest taxes on Cape Cod and we need to make sure that we spend it efficiently and effectively. As a self-employed chiropractor, I deal with open communication, financing, managing staff. These skills will help me navigate challenges that we face in the committee. Our students deserve the best education we can provide for their voices to be heard. And your time's up. Safe and respected. Over the next hour, I will outline why I am positioned to make these goals a reality. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Okay, I'm gonna start off the first question. By the way, any questions that are coming from the audience, you're welcome to ask them to one candidate. You can ask them to all. Um, it's up to you. And I'm gonna start with the first question to all of you. What do you see, and if you could be specific, what do you see as the top priorities for the school committee in the next year? Thank you, Greg. Um, I think that the top priorities of the school committee, we're going to be undergoing a big transition with the new superintendent beginning. And I believe that we, we need to learn about him. He needs to learn about us. He, I, I believe that he, uh, how do I say it? Um, I feel like that we should, that we, we need to, um, I'm sorry, one sec. I just need a second. <laughs> That's okay, take your okay. time. Thank you. <laughs> now the biggest issues over the, the next year is the transition process of Dr. Gould retiring uh, and the new superintendent beginning. And I think we need to see what he has to bring to the table, what the new superintendent does. Yeah. Okay. Christine or Aaron? Thank you. I agree. That transition of Dr. Muschek to filling those big shoes that Pam Gould has left behind is a, a very important one. I also think a big issue that we will be forced to reckon with and discuss is the issues of diversity and inclusion um, in our schools, in our towns. Um, and I do think it will still be focusing on recovery from COVID, you know, lost learning for students and trying to make sure that we can regain any solid footing that we had educationally previously. Okay. And Aaron, I'll just remind all of you guys just to talk real close to the microphone. Okay. okay. You, yeah, you can Greg. pull the whole thing. I echo some of those statements. Uh, I think post-COVID recovery, our students have suffered a massive learning loss, socially and emotionally as well. We need to really help them get back on track and eventually uh, give them the tools so they can advance uh, in 
the next levels of school and eventually in life. Uh, open communication through the school committee is so important, especially with the new superintendent. I, I read a recent article uh, interview on him and he's, one of his priorities is post-pandemic learning and, and the loss. I think that's so important. Uh, is that the school committee really has to come together and see both sides of the coin and really work together for, to find a common ground. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from the audience for these candidates? Come on. You didn't come here just to watch, did you? Uh, let me ask you guys this. Um, there is a, a big topic in this community these days from a recent news event that, not even a news event, but um, a very real life event that happened in the high school back in February. Raise your hands if you agree or if you believe that sandwich has a race issue. So let's, Christine, let me, let me pick on you. Why? I've seen it firsthand. Um, I've heard things that have come from people's voices, from people, people's mouths. Um, I've seen the way students and people in general are tre treated. Um, I stood out in the, the little park across the street and had, um, you know, in terms of supporting Black Lives Matter and had awful things said to me and thrown at me from cars driving by. Um, again, I don't think it's unique to Sandwich. I don't think it's unique to Massachusetts. It's definitely a global issue, but it absolutely is something that is an issue in Sandwich. Uh, on the school committee, with you on the school committee, should you be elected, what would your cont contribution be to that issue? So. My own professional training, I've been a school psychologist for 25 years, worked with students, parents, school communities around a variety of issues focused on mental health and other issues that stem from discrimination, bullying, racism, sexism. Um, and I've recently completed a diversity, equity, inclusion certificate through Cornell University um, that has helped me really understand the systemic aspects of those kinds of issues and how they can be addressed and how they need to be acknowledged um, in order for communities to be safe for all. Aaron, I'm uh, Dr. Selfridge. I want to be appropriate there. Um, you raised your hand about racism in this community. Give me your thoughts there. Well, well the incident that you just cited is a big example of that. Um, Communications, everything with these problems, and a lot of times they go unaddressed until something like this happens, and it brings and sheds a, a light into something that's dark, and people really avoid uh, in conversation in particular. Uh, this case really could have been avoided if if there was uh, open communication with administration, uh, principal, teacher, uh, social worker, uh, just to to relay the derogatory comments and not turn to violence. Unfortunately, both of these kids were wrong. Uh, you never endorse uh, any sort of racism or discrimination, but obviously you don't ever endorse violence either. But as far as um, the school goes, the, the DAC program, the Diversity, uh, Equity, Inclusion, Action, and Community plans are, are, are great. We just have to involve more parents, more children, and uh, get more education out there. And like, like Christine said, this is not just a sandwich problem, unfortunately. This is, uh, this is a countrywide problem. And Danielle. Well, these are difficult conversations, but we must have them. We have to find ways to build bridges and solve problems. The, the racial incident, uh, as Dr. Gould had sent, sent us all letters last, last week in email, uh, that there are a lot of programs in place. We just need to build on them. We really do in the schools. The, she had discussed about hiring us a, a uh, support person in each school so that maybe the children can trust and, and talk to. Uh, there's a lot of kind of, a lot of broken areas of communication that need to come together. Uh, she discussed about the, in the last five years, Sandwich has been doing a lot of professional development, a lot of 
seminars and to make it more culturally responsive. And I feel like we need to bridge these gaps. Absolutely. Okay. Question right here. If you could stand up, name and your address. Kim Ruddy, Christopher Hollow Road. Just a question about what your thoughts are on, on critical race theory. And as a follow-up, should it be included in our kids' programs? And if so, at what age and how should it be done? Whoever wants to start. I'll go. It's not taught in elementary schools, in middle schools, in high schools. Um, I, as a graduate in education, um, with a master's in education, an advanced graduate degree in education, I'm still learning what critical race theory is. There's no, it doesn't sit in our curriculum currently. Um, it is a graduate school, law school concept, so I, I don't believe it is taught in our public schools at all, and I don't think it is relevant. Would either of you have a comment on that and the question, of course? Danielle? Yeah, absolutely. Um, CRT is not in the Massachusetts frameworks. It's not being taught in the sandwich schools. And most, I'm not an expert on CRT. Um, I, I've seen it on the news, but I, I won't consider myself an expert on that. Uh, CRT is mostly taught in law schools, but we also, we need to acknowledge the progress that has been made with race, with issues of race over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, CRT is not, no, it's not in the Massachusetts frameworks, and I don't believe it will be. Aaron? Uh, yes, um, I, I echo those comments. <clears throat> I've researched that it. it is not in our curriculum. Um, or a Massachusetts curriculum. Um, I, I think the DEAC programs that we have in, in place right now are so important. The ADL programs, the World of Difference programs that recognize bias uh, is, is so important. Also, the school is rolling out a mentor program for the fall, which allows upperclassmen to help negotiate these tough questions with underclassmen in regards to bullying and race and really any general social emotional um, responses they have. But uh, CRT in general, I think, is more of a concept than, uh, than, than in a reality. OK. Any other questions? Go ahead. If you could s Just stand up. OK. Jonathan Finn. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to go slow, and hopefully it won't crack in the middle here. Um, this is a question for Aaron Selfridge. Um, I know from social media that you felt that you've received unfair scrutiny, uh, but many have felt that you're concealing your true beliefs. After you announced for school committee, you did a major edit of your Facebook presence, uh, sanitizing it by removing dozens of far-right fringe sites and personalities. Um, I have a partial list here, if you want me to go through anything. Um, why did you hide your beliefs by deleting all these links, and why should voters trust you when you're concealing that? Yeah, great question. Um, I wanted the, the focus to be on the running for school committee and not be distracted by um, things that I follow. Um, I am a conservative, and I do follow some of these programs. Doesn't mean I agree with everything. Uh, you know, some of this is, was personal information. I didn't even know half the things I was following until it was addressed to me. I'm not on Facebook very often. So I deleted that because I didn't want it to be a distraction. But I will never hide from anything. You will always get an honest answer from me. And as far as um, the, the, the cyber bullying and, and, and really some, some tough comments to me personally and professionally, it was, it was uh, unnerving to say the least. Uh, we talk about anti-bullying protocols in school and strategies. I think this starts with our community and our adults and parents. They need to set a good example and model this behavior. And it got to the point where I just shut it off because I was getting attacked every way to Sunday, so I couldn't even answer a regular routine question. Thank you for that. It was a great question. I'd just like to pick up on the social media piece. Um, we have um, a lot of noise in social media, and you know, Aaron. He, you were just talking about it from a personal perspective. How has social media, in your opinion, changed the way you feel that the school committee work is being interpreted and heard about or learned 
into the community from your perspective, having not been on the school committee before? I think it could be a great platform. I think you can educate people, you can let them know uh, nearly immediately as to what's going on, what changes are available. It allows you to conduct uh, transparency with curriculum and budgets. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's also a platform for hate and it can side rail the conversation and you try and avoid that as much as you can. You can try and ignore it. You can try and answer it. But as far as school committee goes or any elected officials, I think it's a great platform to be able to convey messages to the citizens and district. Okay. We'll go down the line. Christine. In terms of it being used as a platform or a tool for school committee members, I would disagree and say that it's not the proper channel for school committee members to communicate. Um, I think there needs to be more of more official channel and there are certainly opportunities for the community to have conversations, ask questions um, of school committee members, but I don't believe a back and forth on Facebook is the right avenue for that to happen. Um, I do think it's a great tool for communication, as Dr. Selfridge said, in terms of putting information out there, sharing, I love the fact that we have access to televised meetings and recordings of all kinds of information so that people can have ac access to what happens in the town without actually being um, in the room at the time. Uh, but again, in terms of a channel for back and forth conversations, I don't like that. I like having an overview of kind of seeing what the sentiments are in town, what things are important to members of our own community. Um, but I would never use it as a as a tool for a school committee member for communication. Okay, Danielle. I would have to agree with that as well. Being uh, the chairperson of the CPAC for the last four years, it's a great platform to host events and uh, activities for children. Uh, I don't think anybody should fall down that rabbit hole of going back and forth on Facebook and social media especially with school committee issues. It's, a lot of it is it's sensitive, a lot of the material that you're talking about. Um, and I would rather, if, if I were to be on school committee, I would rather meet with the, peop with, with the, the stakeholders in town and, and communicate by email or meet for a coffee if there's an issue or anything like that. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, please stand up. Hi, Jim Cote, 55 Freeman Ave. Um, I have a question for Dr. Selfridge. Um, on your April 6 PSA video, you indicate that 2.5 million was received by the district. It was earmarked for outdoor use, but the school used it to hire additional staff that they will not be able to retain. So two-part question, where is it stated that the funds were designated for outdoor use, and um, are you aware of any pending layoffs that we don't know about? Uh, great question, Jim. Um, I'll, I'll address the first part. Um, so, so back in September, the school received a uh, COVID relief grant. It was an URSA three grant, which is a restricted grant. Uh, that grant had earmarks for outdoor play, PPE, sanitation, air purification. There were certain restrictions that it could be used for. I was at that meeting and when Dr. Gould put the restrictions on the board, um, they, you know, they, they were trying to figure out at the time what they were going to use it for. I was hopeful that they were going to actually use it to replace the Forestdale Playground and maybe the Oak Ridge Playground as well. They ended up hiring staff, and I, and I didn't know with the debt exclusion if they were going to be able to retain some of the staff. But uh, I could be wrong on that, but that's so far what I've heard. But, um, you know, that's, I was at that meeting, and that's the gist of what, what I received. <clears throat> I'd be happy to speak to some of that as well, just kind of a clarification on um, the, the intention of the ESSER funds. Um, I don't believe they were earmarked for outdoor use, but some of the, one of the potential uses could have been mental health. Um, and I actually believe the school committee lobbied to, well, lobbied is probably not the right word, um, but to use some of that funds for playground use, so they did actually earmark some of the ESSER funds to go towards our playground under the umbrella of mental health, so not because it was for outdoor spaces. 
um, and the other part around the staff that were hired during COVID, they were hired specifically for purpose of being able to educate our children during times of COVID when they needed to be seated farther apart, you could have fewer students in the classroom, which meant you needed more classrooms with more teachers to be able to educate our kids. So because we were able to have a large portion of our students in person, we did hire temporary staff that were hired as long-term substitutes and they were not permanent employees. Okay, Danielle, did you wanna say something? Yes, yes. Um, I think Mr. Selfridge, um, confused maybe the the ESSER funds so the the teachers that were hired that was in the, the fall of 2020 that was the ESSER one funds and there were teachers that were hired for a one-year contract so there were no layoffs um, they were temporary positions because when we returned to school we had to have more space for our students um, the ESSER one funds there was there were teachers and actually um, so no one was laid off, and actually some teachers were hired at the end of the year. It was like they had a one-year in interview with the principal, and teachers that retired, there were a few positions that were filled permanently. Even the custodian was a temporary custodian and ended up with a full-time job because of somebody retiring. So um, nobody was laid off, and that was in fall of 20 when we returned to school. And then the, the playground, the that was under the ESSER three funds, which was available this November. So they talked about it this fall. The ESSER three funds uh, had a spot for mental health and the school committee came together and, and appealed to DESE and said, could we use $85,000 of this for playgrounds for mental health? And they agreed to it. So there's two different, there's three types of ESSER funds, ESSER one, two, and three that all did different things. And the teachers were in the September of 20 ESSER funds. And the, actually, the beauty of the ESSER funds, there's, it was for $2.4 million. And with the capital plan coming up, they were able to move $2 million, They want to move $2 million of the, the funds from the ESSER 3 funds into the capital plan to bring the cost down. Uh Aaron, I just want to ask, this, this kind of is a, a lightning rod off of the PSA that you had done with that. How do you feel right now with the question, with kind of the, the clarification, if you will? Um, do you feel that your position is better understood? Um, well, you know, just listening to these guys know more about these funds uh, than I do. I, I've gone to the school committee meetings over the last two years, and some of it's still honestly confusing with the different ESSER grants and how they can be used and appropriated. Um, I know they had hired extra staff for uh, COVID purposes to help out the nursing staff uh, as well. but. Um, yeah, just my hopes, like I said, just my hopes were that this was going to be, some of the funding was going to be used for the playgrounds during, especially during COVID because it was so important for these kids to get outside this year and the year before uh, for outdoor play and mass breaks. Great. Excellent. Question back here. If you could stand up and name an address and blood type. I'm kidding. Oh, you're going to hold it? Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Peter Shouty, 6 Crescent Hill Road. Um, and I have a question for all three of the candidates, although first I want to say thank you to all of you, both you on the school board and the other people that are running for elected office. We have um, made this a difficult proposition for anybody to do this. They're doing a job for little or no compensation, and I think we ought to keep that in mind and thank them for putting themselves out there as opposed to being derogatory and accusational. Okay, with that as the background. I'd like to, um, one of the issues students most often face, um, often face, most often from class months, although not always, is bullying. We've spoken a little bit about it here, and I'd like to know what's your position and what steps you will advocate to prevent bullying and to address it directly if and when it occurs. I am particularly interested in your response considering this campaign season has seen a great deal of unprofessional, disrespectful, and downright mean comments and accusations from some of the people participating in online discussions. Again, given that those same people may be parents, relatives, friends, neighbors of sandwich school children, how will you address the example, a bad one, set by these people because you do not operate in a vacuum on the school committee? Thank you. Yep, Aaron. 
Yeah, great question. Uh, we, we did hit this a little bit, but there is no place for hurtful or disrespectful or threatening behavior in a school system. This behavior needs to be dealt with immediately and needs to be conveyed to the parents and obviously to social workers and principals. Uh, we need to have, continue to educate our students and our staff and our parents on bullying and especially now with cyberbullying. It's even uh, worse because it's mental and not physical. Uh, a lot of parents have no idea that their kids are even on these platforms and what they're saying and what's going on. And it's directly related to some of this, the high suicide rates we're seeing now, unfortunately, especially during this pandemic and post-pandemic. A huge problem is uh, just the access and lack of restriction. Uh, and, and like I said, parents really, in some cases, don't even realize it's happening until it gets reported. So I think we could do a better job overall by uh, keeping a closer look on what our kids are involved with online, teaching them that bullying and physical and mental abuse is, un is unnecessary and uncalled for and will result in a, some sort of a penalty. Uh, this goes along with uh, some of the racial problems we're having. If, if it's left unchecked, then it'll be unchecked and get worse. If we can correct it and provide education and provide support for these, for these parents and children, I think that goes a really long way. Danielle? Um, bullying is always brought up. I have a special needs son, and bullying is always brought up at our IEP meeting every year. Um, and teachers, they ask the parents as well as the teachers, do you acknowledge any or notice any, have heard of any bullying happening within the schools? And thankfully, we have not. Um, and we're into fourth grade now. But it is an issue, absolutely, especially cyberbullying. Um, there's so much that goes on that the parents, parents, we try, we try to, to be abreast of the situations happening. So I feel that Dr. Gould had mentioned as well that we, there were going to be some revisions to the bullying, the anti-bullying policies in the disciplinary man, in the student manuals next year. Um, and I look forward to to seeing if there's any other programs that we can utilize, but yeah, communication is the key. Okay, and Christine. So just like the issue with racism, sexism, sexual harassment, um, gender discrimination, it's not just a school issue. Bullying is an issue within our community. As you pointed out, there were lots of people oftentimes kind of ganging up on Aaron's posts for sure. So I've seen it, I've seen it happen with adults plenty of times on any of the local social media channels. Bullying happens. But I also think one of the most important things to remember about bullying is it can also be an overused term. Um, it has a very specific definition, especially when it comes to schools, and it doesn't apply to all situations. There's meanness, there's divisiveness, there's negativity, um, there's calling out someone for something they've said, but not all of that equates to bullying. So I think that we need to be careful with using the term, um, but we also need to be careful about the example that we show to our children as the adults in the community. Okay. Question over here from my old friend. Uh, Count Johansson, concerned citizen in the town of Sandwich. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I'd like to say one thing, uh, and then before I ask a question. In my years since I've lived in this town, we have been presently have been really blessed by some of the leadership that we've had in the school system. And I would personally say that Dr. Gould and I've spoken to her on many occasions about the same subject you're, you're talking about here. She's always had a very progressive and positive attitude in trying to make sure that we are all one people. Now, my question here is, the school system presently now has a huge budget before them this year in the capital expenses. Our, we have allowed our school system the functioning buildings to deteriorate to a point that they need to have a tremendous amount of money put into them, which we should vote for. But my feeling is what would you do to make sure going forward that we would have some semblance that the school committee 
will be looking at finding a way to fund this over a long-term period to prevent a colossal blowdown at the end of the situation where instead of you need 100 million, you only need a million, that type of thing. And that's basically where I'm thinking. Great. Um, Aaron, we'll start with you. We keep going from uh, right to left, which is fine. Yeah, yeah excellent question. Uh, you know, th there's so many factors in, um, in the maintenance of these schools. Um, Obviously, the debt exclusion is going to cover a lot of things like the boilers, HVAC, roof, uh, playgrounds. Um, but yeah, there's, it's hard to imagine that the high school has a roof that leaks every time the wind blows and the rain, it rains. Like la last night, I'm sure it leaked. Um, we discussed this at the playground meetings. Um, there are options for having hiring or spending extra money for a maintenance plan. So this, this is probably something that's w worthwhile to put the extra money in and have that company come back out and check each of these projects that they do and maintain them as opposed to just having something be unchecked and fail before it really is at, at the end of its life. But in this case, you know, the boilers from 88, they're probably uh, running on their last breath right now. But yes, that's a great question. And I think the maintenance programs I would highly endorse. Yeah, thank you. Christine? I would agree that maintenance in general is an important part of, of any budget. We're at a weird point in time just based on when the skills, schools were built that, and we've got two schools built right around the same time that everything is coming to the forefront all at once. Um, but this is a long range plan. This is a 15 year plan that's been put out there to provide and to replace and to fix the envelope of the building, which I, yes, did have to Google, but think I know under what that means now. The HVAC systems, the, the, the roofs, um, just seeing the physical pictures, the playgrounds, um, maintenance needs to be a part of any budget. It's tough with a school budget where you, the hugest part of your budget goes to staff. That is what schools are. Staff is teachers, staff is educators. Um, so that's the biggest portion of our budget. And I know the school committee fights every year for more money, but the amount that's been built into the budget has not been adequate enough to address some of these really big Pro, uh, big issues that are needing some addressing now. So I think they've done a great job in responding to the request of the Finance Committee to say, let's put it all out there. Let's look long term. How can we look at what needs to be, go needs to be fixed, needs to be replaced, um, and make a plan for it going forward? Okay. Danielle? Yeah, I agree as well. The, the buildings are in dire need. Uh, the, the boilers are 34 years old. I mean, we're lucky that they're still working, 34 years old. Um, I think that Dr. Gould and John Nelson have done a really good job of prioritizing coming up with a 15-year plan, prioritizing what is needed right now, what, is, what can we foresee down the road. So there aren't any, any uh, surprises thrown at the, at the voters down the road. I feel that... Um, that the capital plan, now's the time to do it while the interest rates are still low and the, uh, they're not luxury items that we're asking for, they're essential items. Heat, ventilation, roofs that don't leak, safe playgrounds, it's all essential. But I feel that we need to keep the maintenance plan in place, we need to make sure that those new playgrounds are maintained. Uh, Christine was part of the original playground project. So we, it's really important that maintenance is top priority. Okay, question over here. Hi, my name is Meg Keegan at 13 Joe J. Lane. Can you, tell me a time, uh, can you tell me about a time when you had to collaborate with someone that had a different strategy to meet the same goal? Danielle, you're hitting the, oh, I saw your hand going forward. Whoever wants to go first. I'll, I'll go first on this one. So that's kind of my day to day. Um, again, as a school psychologist, I work with parents, children, teachers, administrators to really come to solutions that meet everyone's need. And everyone has different agendas and everyone has a different priority. 
Um, so I think coming to that common ground, so I'm not, I, I apologize, I can't give you a really good specific example, I'm, my brain doesn't work that way, but my ability to come to a common ground of what's our common interest. In my role, it's always the, the child. So are all, all working together towards that same interest and listening, listening to what other options exist, not coming in with one very specific um, goal that you want to you know, co complete a specific way uh, without hearing the options. Um, I think that, that that's the way to make um, a good community happen is to hear all voices. Yeah, Danielle. Sure. I also think flexibility and uh, hearing each side out and communication is the key to problem solve and collaborate and come together with a solution. I, um, I, I've dealt with this on the CPAC over the years. You, different, you know, different mindsets of whether it be a parent or administrator, and you need to find common ground. You need to sit down at the table and talk and communicate, and that's how we can solve problems and come together to to get a solution. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, yes, I, I deal with this on a regular basis with uh, little league kids and basketball and soccer, uh, trying to get them to buy into a, a program and uh, exploit their strengths. Um, but yeah, on a daily basis, this in my office, I, I try and find common grounds, common ground with uh, health insurance companies, which that is not easy. <laughs> But uh, yes, it, it is so important to be able to compromise, listen to the other person's side of the issues, and just work together to, to create a solution and not more of a problem. So the word communication keeps coming up. And clearly, uh, communication is how the world runs. Where would you say that the, the school committee, and I'm going to ask you to kind of pick on them a little bit, or at least just have some um, some, some candid thoughts here. Where has the school committee not communicated enough if you are really championing bringing more communication to the school committee? Uh, um, well, for me, um, I, I was a strong, I've been a strong advocate for parental rights through the last two years. Uh, in my opinion, I thought that the parents should have been choosing whether they were kids were wearing masks in school. Um, the first year, obviously, this was a state, it was a state of emergency. It came from the governor, but this past year, it came from the board of education. Um, so, fast forwarding, the um, the current school committee had written th uh, four letters to Commissioner Riley and the board of education asking for transparency and the science behind the masking of the kids. They gave an automated answer, which was um, which was very unfortunate because they had an opportunity to actually address the issues. And then the school committee voted no confidence in Commissioner Riley and the DESE guidelines. And but unfortunately, nothing changed with that. So that was a little disappointing. Christine or Danielle? Um, I can't speak to specific deficits in communication for the school committee, but I know as a parent, um, it takes a lot to be involved in a school. Um, and not all communication about schools comes from school committee, comes from superintendent. There are just so many layers of where communication happens um, from a school to, to the community. So it does take a lot of work, reading newspaper articles, listening to meetings, figuring out what's going on. Um, I've been grateful that we've had some great updates. Again, one of my favorite communication strategies that Pam Gould used was on a snow day. There was always a description of why. It wasn't just there's no school today, here's why. I talked to DPW, they don't think they're gonna be able to clear these roads, bus routes won't be safe, wish it weren't the case. You know, those commun that communication that's real and honest and upfront to people is helpful. The other part that's difficult with communication, I think, is there is, there is some information within schools, um, within the, that the school committee would, would address that everybody is not privy to. So it's not, again, I'll speak to a time where I remember you know, Facebook blowing up over, there was a lockdown at the high school, and everybody wanted to know why. Um, 
and you don't always know why. You're not gonna know why. It could have been someone throwing up in the hallway or a teacher having a heart attack or a dog got into the building, but it's not always information that everybody has access to. So there are privacy rights that students have. Students are minors. You're not gonna hear about how discipline is handled um, in individual student situations. So there's, there is, there's that balance between what information is um, important to share and necessary to share and what important information we're able to share. Danielle, anything to add? Sure. Communication is the key to, to everything, I feel. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the school committee with their communication. I, I read the newspapers. I watch the, the meetings. Um, we're here most, most Wednesdays for the meetings. Um, I, I think communication has been really good under this superintendent with Dr. Gould, and I really hope that it continues as the new superintendent begins as well. Yeah. Okay, and question over here. Hi, I'm Margot Critchfield, uh, Boardwalk Road in Sandwich. Um, I'm a former member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee, also known as DIAC. Uh, and a current member of Sandwich for All. So my question uh, has to do with uh, DIAC, and that is um, a number of schools on the South Shore and on the Cape uh, have hired directors of DEI, of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. If that were a recommendation brought before the school committee by DIAC, is that something that you would support? Christine, this seems to be right up your alley. <laughs> um, so I know that there were current, there are currently some stipended positions that are proposed by um, Dr. Gould that I believe will put in place, but that just, that's a tip of the iceberg. Um, it's a start, I think. Um, it's difficult. Sandwich is a small district, um, especially compared to other districts on the Cape. So that is a big position for a full position for a smaller district that has a lot of administrative roles. But I think it's critically important. I'm wondering how it can be implemented and how, not implemented, but how it could be um, blended into work that could be done in a greater community level. Um, but I do think that it is a critical uh, role that needs to be served within Sandwich Schools. Danielle? I agree with that as well. I'm I am encouraged that there's a DIAC committee now in the, in the district, and I, I think that that would be something to look into. I, I would love to, I wanna see how these, these stipended staff positions, uh, what they involve, what they entail, but that is something that would probably serve our schools really well, especially at this point in time. Okay, and Aaron. Yes, I also agree with that, um, with the DIAC program and the ADL program, and also with the mentor program. I imagine, uh, I know there was a subcommittee, but I imagine somebody has to um, lead that group, especially the mentor program in particular. Uh, these are all, this is all comes down to communication, like we were all saying, and if you have someone that's in the leadership role to communicate this to the, to the students and staff, I think that's so important. Okay, and a question over here. Uh, yeah, just circling back to um, the, the, the whole subject of bullying, and I know that I agree with Christine that, that we're, we're, we're putting a lot under that umbrella. Where you can have all of the um, plans and policies um, are in place, but where there seems to be a failure is where the student who's being bullied or a, a, a student who witnesses bullying goes to before feeling that their only course is to go punch the guy in the face. So I'm wondering if, you know, if you've given that thought, if, if, if how, how, that to me seems to be the missing piece or where failure occurs. You can have the best of intentions as an administration, but if kids in the hallway or hearing people call other kids the N word or harass, sexually harassing them or, um, you know, just bullying them in other ways um, and yet don't feel empowered to go and have a place to correct that, I think that's almost more important than having policies that really don't do much. 
Okay, who wants to take that first? I'm happy to jump in on that one. So again, I did get, don't think it's a, an issue that's unique to Sandwich. It certainly is a school issue across the board. There are, there are places to go. The issue is it's not places kids are comfortable going. Um, as a, and, that, and that's by no fault of the person to whom it should be reported, to no fault of an administrator or of a um, social worker or anything in that regards. Um, it just, and there are, everyone's got a bullying protocol, an investigation report, those things exist, so on paper it's there and it looks good. But kids don't necessarily operate that way. I can just say from the community that I work in that we're exploring all kinds of options from, um, you know, bullying or racism reporting buttons that are on their Chromebook where they can file an anonymous report that goes to a Google form to someone, um, texting options, things that really reach the point of where kids are, but also bystanders training for peers um, for, so that kids know if they've heard of something happening, they know what to do and how to handle it. Because I think that's usually the, the group of people are hearing about bullying or racism or sexism or any of that first is really their peers. Um, and it's difficult in a huge expectation, a huge to, to expect a child to be able to know how to manage something like that. Um, whereas again, I think it's even difficult for adults to do that. So to expect a fourth grader or a 10th grader or a 12th grader to be able to know, okay, this is something I need to do and I need to take a stand for. It's, it's a, it's a, it takes a skill and it takes um, some support. So I think the where exists, but the how needs to meet the people where they are. Aaron? <clears throat> I totally agree with that. And, and getting uh, kids who are scared to communicate that with somebody uh, is very difficult. Uh, that's why some of these programs emphasize the fact for them not to be scared and, and open communication. Just for as an example, if a kid is bullied and there's two counts of it, the parents and the children and the, and the administration meet and they become up with a bullying strategy. So that would take place and, and hopefully diffuse the problem, separating the kids, con contacting the other family members or parents. I think it's so important uh, that that bridge is crossed and that these kids feel safe enough to come out and, and communicate that. Yeah, thank you. Danielle. Yes, I, I agree with all of this. There, there needs to be outlets for our kids to, to feel safe, to feel that they can trust somebody to, to report this. Um, I, I hope that all of the plans in place that they can add upon them that are that are existing in the schools right now, and I feel I think that we're going to take a closer look at everything and build upon these programs for sure. Okay, Bob, you said you had one follow up. You know, I just wanted to add. It also seems um, ineffectual to me to just uh, suspend a kid as a result of having been a bully, perhaps. Um, or to have, you know, committed, you know, a, sort of a heinous act on someone. It, would you not agree that there should be something more than, you know, the, in other words, if, if somebody's bullied somebody badly enough, as in the case that we have heard of recently, that the, that the, the bully himself receives some sort of, you know, educational piece or, I don't know, something more than just being sent home for three days and coming back to school and, and believing that, okay, everything's fixed now. Sorry, I'm jumping in again. Yeah. Um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. There needs to be, again, bullying doesn't just come from nowhere. Um, so the, the person who is engaging in the bullying themselves, there are certainly some supports that that student needs to figure out why they're getting to the point where they are treating other people with that level of hatred. Um, so there needs to be support, social emotional support for both the bully and the victim in any kind of a situation like that. Um, the tough thing is, um, again, parents do have rights um, and a parent can object to any kinds of services that, the, that um, a school might recommend or suggest, whether it's outside counseling or supports within the schools. Um, so I'm not sure that it is delivered in a way that um, does what it should in terms of addressing and building skills in both parties. Anyone else want to contribute to this? 
Uh, yes, I, th I think um, I think the, the the bullying strategy portion of it, where everybody is coming together and they're discussing what actually every case is obviously very different. Um, extreme cases are going to result in extreme uh, discipline, but just regular cases too. When it's always better to get people together to discuss this, whether it be uh, you know the family, the kids, the administration, and on both sides to communicate their side of the story: what happened, what didn't happen, what can we do from here? You know, nobody wants to uh, suspend kids and get them out of school. So, you know, in some cases, you know, you can just find some some middle ground and uh, and try and work out the problem without getting a kid uh, expelled from school. But Obviously, some of these cases are very, very different, and unfortunately, they, they've lingered on long enough that they result in violence, sadly. Yep, Christine hit it again, <laughs> and Aaron. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. I agree that there needs to be support services for both, both parties involved, and, and any time that you can get the families together, the school together to try to problem solve, that would that's probably our best solution um, to have the least you know repercussions against everybody is we really need to curb the bullying I agree okay can I just bring up something else that I just learned about recently um, in Mashpee the the Wampanoag tribe has um, a program that they, I don't, I don't know if it's new, but it's new to me in terms of if there's a situation between students or families that there is a gathering with the elders of the tribe where they work together to kind of build and bridge and bond. Again, it's completely voluntary um, and it's, I, I believe it's restricted to members, families who are belong to the tribe, but it's a wonderful message of First, you have to have the two families who say, hey, there's some healing that needs to be done. Um, let's come together and do this. And that would be wonderful if something like that existed on a, a more global level. All right, question over here. And I think this is going to be the last question because these selectman candidates are like, uh, hello, I'm ready to go. Mine, mine is quick. Uh, Tobin Wirt, 9 Summer Street. A question for all three of you. I think uh, Dr. Selfridge, you touched on it a little bit ago. Uh, and for lack of uh, the more technical term, um, I wanted to know what all three of you thought about the don't say gay bill for K through three um, kids that has that law has been uh, cropping up. Okay. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a new and uh, a hot topic. Um, this is not coming from a political place. This is coming from a common sense place. Um, teaching kids third grade and under sexual ed education will be would be lost on them. This is why we have health class in um, sixth grade, puberty, prepuberty ages, so they can actually ask questions, understand what's going on. The uh, under third grade, I mean, not many people even remember third grade or beyond, but I, I feel like it would be so lost on them, they wouldn't understand it, and uh, it wouldn't relate. Thank you. So I would say there's a big difference between sexual education and not saying gay. Um, there, are, there are gay people are a part of our world just like anybody else. So to exclude a portion of our population that represents families, represents our students, um, just under the basis of, th there never has been sex education taught in third grade, also ludicrous. Um, and even sex education that's taught in schools is the most basic um, of sex education. I actually lobbied. My son happened to be in school during a year when they didn't do the fifth grade video because we didn't have a, a health teacher. Um, it's important, um, and I think I'm going to get away from the sex education piece of it because that's just another part of education, but um, I, I just feel in general that don't say gay bill is, is ludicrous, ridiculous, and beyond that, it's, it's downright just disrespectful and harmful. I agree with that too. I, I, I'm totally against the don't say gay bill. Uh, kids, shouldn't, kids should know that love is love, that it doesn't matter if you have two moms or two dads or you have a grandparent raising you. And yeah. Uh, it's just ludicrous. The whole thing is ludicrous, absolutely. Um, 
they're not teaching sex ed in the younger age groups. And a child should be able to draw a picture of their two moms or talk about what they did over the weekend with their two dads. Absolutely. And I'm thankful we live in Massachusetts and not Florida. <laughs> I want to wrap up and end on this. Um, I'd love for each of you to give me a couple of words, and you can't use each other's words, a couple of words that describe you, differentiate you from each other um, as we are all considering a vote for selectmen. Uh, sorry. Yeah, you, did you know that you're running for selectmen? Because these questions are just not right for selectmen, but who wants to go first? And if it's a big word, I'm going to make you spell it. <laughs> Two. I would say compassionate and trustworthy would be two words. Thanks. It's a tough one. Um, Engaged. Oh, you can have a do-over. Hold on. I don't like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Truly differentiates you. Oh, I'm going to pass for a moment. My brain needs to think. <laughs> I, I think uh, honest and transparent. Christine, don't make me come up with two words. No, sorry. I'm just no met. Perspective. Um, and inclusion. Great. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Candidates for school committee, Danielle Benetta, Christine Brown, Dr. Aaron Selfridge. Don't forget to vote on Thursday, May 5th. We're going to take a break real quick, reset the table, uh, and we will start with the selectmen in a couple